Hey guys, I'm Chris. Hey everybody, I'm Robert. And we're the Film Flamers. And it's time for us to shoot the flames like we do the start of every month. And here we are, shooting November. And oh my god, am I excited for this month. I feel like we've been waiting for this month our entire lives. Or at least our entire podcast career. Really? November, right. specifically? Yes, Gateway Horror Month. Oh, that's right! <laughs> yes, we need to be <laughs> all up in the Gateway Horror. <laughs> well, we are very excited to talk about those things. Yeah, I mean, this month we are coming out with our top 10 Gateway Horror movies next week. And then the week after, we're going to be deep diving into some of those Gateway Horror movies, including... The NeverEnding Story. And Legend. That's right. And over on Patreon, we'll be doing more Gateway Horror. Right. We'll be giving you a poll so you get to decide. So become a patron and let your will be known. That's right. Choose your favorite Gateway Horror and we'll talk about it. From the ones that we selected you to choose from. (laughs) Choose from our refuse pile. Trickle down economics on this podcast. <laughs> That's how we do it. Maybe we'll get a bad comment on YouTube. Um, <laughs> but we don't only get bad comments. We get lots and lots of good ones, including reviews. We got a new five-star review from Steve Ramos Media. And he said, are you a horror geek? You'll love the film Flamers. The spooky season of Halloween is upon us. I'm listening to the horror movie podcast, The Film Flamers. Co-hosts Chris and Robert combine impressive research into past horror movies with comic chatter. You can tell Chris and Robert are true horror fans and pals. Oh, we are. As a fellow genre geek, I'm a Godzilla-sized admirer of the show. I feel like we got this review originally on Facebook, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone did. They, like, um tagged us on Facebook and wrote that they were listening to the podcast. And I thought it was very sweet. And I thanked them on there. And um, yeah, that was nice. We don't get a lot of love on Facebook sometimes. So uh, yeah. it was and here it is. And here it is on iTunes. So. That's right. Helping yeah. us out with that review. For real. And it is a review 66. We're almost there. <laughs> if we get to that magic number and uh, Rotten Tomatoes doesn't let us become reviewers, I don't even know what I'll do. Continue on. Continue we'll soldier on. Podcast. Yeah, I think my <laughs> life will probably but be fine. But <laughs> that said, review us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> we still want it to happen. Well, thank you for that review. And thank you for that uh, tag on Facebook. We really appreciate all support, guys. So if you would like to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or anywhere, really, uh, do so. And we will read that on the next Shooting the Flames. So we got a lot of comments. Yes, we do. It's a full episode. Yeah. So let's start with uh, our comment from Nikki on Prometheus. And she said, fellas, to clarify my comment, y'all made a statement about being sympathetic to Shaw as they were about to torch Holloway. And if I were Shaw, I would have been tearfully torching my man. (laughs) In all horror movies, I'm quick to say, sorry, babe, but we've got to take you out to my hubby's chagrin. Also, Pandy is new to me. We call it Rona, but maybe that's cultural. I feel like this discussion or this continuing comments discussion has been happening since we deep dived those movies at the beginning of the summer or whenever it was. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I commented back on this over on Patreon and said, oh yeah, we're, we're totally on board with, with that. Like totally, you know, I was empathetic towards Shaw, but you know, we torch Holloway too in a second. Oh, definitely. Right. I, I want to live no matter what. Also, we've heard Rona too. I don't think that's so much cultural, but Pandy is, is new to us as well. Yeah, no, Rona, I have heard a lot. Like, my family says Rona, but uh, Pandy, that was <laughs> just too funny of a cute name to not say all the time. <laughs> really? <laughs> Pandy. Uh, from our Shooting the Flames October episode, Fembot18 over on Instagram says, Your nightmare episodes were fantastic and gave this little Freddy freak just what she needed. Love you guys. Thank God. I, I feel like we just didn't get the comments that we were looking for for those. We got some. And the, some of the, the, those comments were good. But, you know, I thought there would be a little bit more discussion based off of um, Freddy's Revenge, at least. Yeah. Um, and we didn't hear a lot of, like, feedback for negative or positive based on our finally getting a deep dive in for, you know, the original Nightmare on Elm Street. So I, I like that we're getting more kind of trickling in. Yes, I agree too. And I feel like as people go and listen to those episodes again, we'll probably get some more comments. And we always discuss comments on older episodes too. We're going to have some of those coming up. That's right. So Bennett sent us an email. Okay. And he said, I just finished listening to this hours after it landed. And I have a few things to address. One, thanks for addressing Interview of the Vampire. 
However, I have to clarify a misunderstanding. I didn't mean in any way to infer that you guys were being racist, especially towards the casting of Louis. I trust you bitches are more evolved than that. <laughs> which, thank you. We are. We are. With that said, it sounds like we're all coming into it very differently. Chris sounds a little bit more purist about details and character development from the original novel. I, on the other hand, just want some pretty gay creatures to look at. <laughs> if you've seen the latest trailer that dropped a week or two ago, I might be more easily pleased. Two... The new Hellraiser looks promising and has been my most eagerly awaited horror film this year. Maybe because I'm getting something this series never really had before. A budget. (laughs) And three, about my staged reading of Suddenly Last Summer, once it's all done and we tape a show, I'll see what I can do about getting you access to that. No promises, but I'll see what I can do. Winky face. Thank Thank you. you. I'm very interested to see how that turns out, Bennett. He also said, P.S., you're right about Exorcist 2 returning to HBO Max. Finally got around to watching it with no commercials and no extra cost. On your star scale, I'd go with two out of five stars. Has some decent visual design and some satisfactory performances from Richard Burton and Linda Blair, but it's such a silly mess. But even though I heard variations on that excruciating main theme throughout the film, they weren't nearly as bad as the version used in the trailer. That was a relief. Yeah, 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 it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you finally watched it. Yes. Oh my God. Finally, you have been threatening to watch Exorcist 2, low these many years, but instead listening to our episode, which is also good. I hope that you went back and listened to our episode yet again. Can you believe you it was actually it. this year that we did Heretic 2? You're right. Yeah. It was last so, November. Low these many it? months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh? My sense of time as I get older is... No, all of our sense of time is fucked after 2020. That's right. It's been defiled. It's been 87 years. It's been 87 years since we did The Exorcist 2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Bennett, uh, stay tuned. We're going to discuss a little bit of Interview with the Vampire as well as Hellraiser coming up in this episode. That's right. We have a segment coming back for y'all. Uh, from our Patreon episode on Serpent and the Rainbow, Davis Ruff said, God, I completely forgot about this movie. And now so have I. Same. (laughs) Poof. Just gone. From our episode on the never-ending story, which we have not released yet. (laughs) Oh. This happened. (laughs) Did we get a message from the future? Oh, I put something on Instagram that we're going to be doing this movie. Okay. Okay. So the Jamie Grayson over on Instagram actually heard from our announcement on Instagram that we were going to cover the never ending story coming up. And of course, that's on all over socials, not just Instagram. And he said, I love this movie so much. I have lobby cards for when it was released in Germany and the first edition hardcover of the book. And I have the score on vinyl, which I paid a lot of adult money for and I have no regrets. I cannot wait to listen to y'all talk about this. I would like deets. (laughs) And I apologize for using the word deets on that vinyl because the score is not complete as it was released at least on like cd or uh, digitally i think so like the ivory tower theme is never really complete and i'd like to to know like what kind of vinyl that is and if it has more tracks than the normal soundtrack did yeah jamie tell us all those deets yes it's it's okay to say deets in the middle of a pandy (laughs) (laughs) and uh stay tuned for our episode that's dropping literally like two weeks from now That's right. So you're going to have to come back to Instagram or wherever you want to comment and uh, let us know what you thought about that episode. From our episode on Tales from the Dark Side, colon, the movie, Sean Homerig over on Patreon said, I used to watch this one over and over again as a kid, and it was one of the first soundtracks I ever bought on CD. However, I don't think it was as good as Creepshow 2. The cat story is ridiculous, and the gargoyle story falls flat for me. Creepshow 2 has a sad revenge story, Old Chief Woodenhead, a genuinely creepy story, The Hitchhiker, and tight yellow bikini briefs, The Raft. Fun fact, the Lover's Vow segment from Tales from the Dark Side was also in the Academy Award-nominated 1965 Japanese horror film, Quite On. Yeah, because it's originally a Japanese folklore, which we said in that deep dive, I believe. Yeah, I think we did somewhere in the fun facts. and then Yeah, I but I didn't know it was actually an, a, an Academy Award-nominated Japanese horror film. I didn't so know I that either. That. And I'd kind of like to watch it, yes, very much. For real. Sean, same. When I was a kid, I watched this movie a lot, so I was very excited to talk about it on the podcast. I have to say that I also watched Creepshow 2 a lot when I was a kid, and I I don't know. Creepshow 2 is good, but uh, I think I like Touching the Dark Side better. When, when it's Creepshow 2, it's all about the raft for me. That is the best story in that movie, and I, I really, really love that segment. Um, 
The other two are good, but not great. I feel like Tales from the Dark Side, for me as a whole, is really, really good. I think I remember the music from the segment The Lover's Vow, but I don't really remember the music from other places, and usually I have an ear for that sort of thing. So it's really interesting to me to hear that that was your first soundtrack you ever bought. Well, I mean, when when one is, you know, affected and obsessed with a movie, then yeah, you're going to want all of it, right? So I I totally get that. But yeah, uh, let us know uh, what tracks you like from that cd or from that score if it's even available for us to listen to so we can listen to them sort of in a vacuum yeah right so joe sanchez over on youtube says awesome i love this movie great review guys loved it i recently discovered you on spotify instant follower Ooh, wish we could get comments on spotify yeah i wish we could too maybe they'll change their interface a little bit at least for podcasts i don't know maybe not thank you joe that could be the only positive comment on youtube we've gotten no we've gotten a lot like i don't want to tell you like it's just like the only negative comments we've ever gotten except Uh for one one negative review ever uh has been on youtube because it's just so available to the masses youtube's where it's at as far as like where all of the different types of people are you know what i mean yeah and people searching for videos and so aren't necessarily people searching for podcasts. So it's kind of a bait and switch. And I really wish we had something better visually for people to look at on YouTube than just like, you know, the moving, you know, audio meter or whatever. So I, I was, I've, I've looked in several times to look for like little ways to like animate faces of us talking and things like that to make it a little bit more entertaining or some way to automate this because our episodes tend to be an hour or longer for our deep dives, you know, and that's hard to edit for a video every fucking week. That's you know, true. Much easier for a podcast. And still, it takes twice as long to edit any of these podcast episodes than it does to record it. You know, so anyway, we've only gotten like two negative comments overall, maybe three, um, you know, but one of them was like, well, this was a waste of seven minutes or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just put like two still images of our faces up there. I'm sure that people will look at that for an hour. Mm. I mean, <laughs> come on, we're hot. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, from our episode on Tales from the Crypt, 1972, Fembot18 over on Instagram said, favorite moment from this podcast, when I knew in my bones, second before you said it, that the next words out of your lovely little mouths was going to be that Oda Mae Brown quote. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Fembot, you, know <laughs> you in danger, girl. <laughs> We can't help ourselves. <laughs> That's a problem. But at least you know us well, right? You know what we're going to say before we say it. That's a listener right mm-hmm. there. For sure. From our episode, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Sean Homburg from Twitter said, Film Flamers, riddle me this. Why is there a poster with a kitty on a trolley in the doctor's office on Nightmare on Elm Street? <laughs> he posted this with a, like a screenshot of that. <laughs> I looked at it. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> there really is. I think I commented back on Twitter and I was just like, uh, he works in like a sleep facility and kitties on trolleys is a relaxing thing to look at. <laughs> I don't know. but I was just, What a weird thing. What a weird piece of like set design. What was the fucking artist or the company that came out with all those colorful binders in the 80s or whatever in the 90s? Lisa Frank. Lisa Frank. It was like Lisa Frank's like, I don't know, before they picked him out of a mental hospital to make kids stuff. <laughs> That's what his paintings were in the mental hospital. I assume that they were just like, let's go find a fucking doctor's office where we can record this scene. And they already had that on the wall. They're like, just leave it. Fuck yeah. it. It's a kitty on a trolley. Uh, but I want that poster now. <laughs> From our Hellraiser Bloodline episode over on Patreon way last February, Horrid Helmet on Twitter said he thought it was better than I expected. I appreciate taking chances, even if the execution isn't all there. Fun to see Kim Myers again right after watching A Night on Elm Street 2. Thought she was very good in both. Plus a great origin story for the puzzle box. Some guy made. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate Hellraiser Bloodline. I feel like more than most because the, the, I just, what did I say in that episode? I feel like the ambition was there. Yes. You know, it's just, they didn't have the budget and they didn't have like quite the directive they needed. That is true. So he, this is actually a comment from his original tweet. So he tweeted during his 31 and 31 in October that he was watching Hellraiser Bloodline. He sort of picked it because he's been thinking about watching it ever since he listened to our bonus episode. Okay. So, uh, Glad to have you on Patreon and glad to have you supporting us on Twitter. So good. I hope that 31 and 31 turned out great. And I know it did because we follow him. We also got a message on Twitter from Matthew McHenry. And he said, I love the podcast overall and every possible level, but the outtakes episodes are the best. <gasps> Finally. Well, he says this every time we have one. Okay. He loves our outtakes episodes. Yeah. 
He's that guy that made those memes and sent them to us, like that RAR. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Matthew, you could be the only person besides us that listens to those. So thank you. Yeah, I think everyone else just kind of like starts thinking they're annoying. Yeah. Or just maybe too lewd. I don't know. No, there's no such thing as too lewd. Too fucking lewd? No. Well, I don't know. Judging from all the parents that are like listening to these episodes on their way to school to drop their kids off. <laughs> they're like, we'll just skip the episode. <laughs> <laughs> like mommy what did that gay man say <laughs> never you mind <laughs> from our top 10 episode on the treehouse of horror kimberly over on patreon said i hope jared fogel is getting fat again in prison so say we all here here <laughs> that's the very least i hope for him but i mean i'm a cynical bastard i'm a bad person i don't know i mean he was he was caught with a, like a child uh molestation molestation ring or whatever uh for child porn yes he had lots of child porn yeah and then he was accused of actual molestation i believe so it's like mm, the least i hope is that he's getting fat again plus i still hold a grudge about that fucking marketing campaign for subway i mean i eat subway every couple weeks or so because we have one at work in the hospital and i haven't lost any weight damn it because it's bread (laughs) (laughs) no one can lose weight after the pandy (laughs) <laughs> I was about to joke <laughs> <laughs> fucking pandy we got some questions and comments okay land of enchantment lobo sent us an email and said your listeners will just have to put up with my random musings on the pre-pandemic episodes of the film flamers what can i say it takes me a long time to process and now a warning <laughs> <laughs> now a warning <laughs> Nay, on a second thought, Robert forbade us ever mention Lincoln's birthday. And that's a Gremlins 2 reference. Yes. In your 2019 episode on Interview with a Vampire, you mentioned Brad Pitt found his role to be boring because he had nothing to do. I guess I can see his point because apart from his forced conversion to vampirism, being the audience's closest link to humanity, endless moral dilemmas, decades of imprisonment by a narcissistic psychopath, the personal torture of his unconsummated love of a woman, tormented inside a prison of his own body, only to watch her murdered slowly and painfully by mocking a troop of satanic vampires. His murderous, vengeful rampage and the entire saga to fall on the deaf ears of his interviewer, resulting in his vampiric freakout and one of the most famous visuals in film history. There really wasn't much death to this role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fun. It's it's funny. Like you can you can watch that whole movie and see all of that, right? But I think what Brad Pitt's chief complaint was that it was completely night shoots yeah. for months. And he was miserable doing that. And it was cold and, and, you know, and and wet, I believe. And they were shooting it in winter and it was night all the time. And they did hours of makeup and made them hang upside down to do their makeup. So they could, their veins would pop. Jesus. You know, and everything like that. So I don't, I don't blame him. Um, You know, we get to see everything in this, you know, hour and a half to two hour format, but there's also the time where he fell in love with new Orleans and he's done a lot of humanitarian work there, especially after Katrina. He really has. And so. that's amazing work. It's and now he's an alcoholic child abuser. So oh, I don't know where the flip is on that, but I blame Tom Cruise <laughs> <laughs> for everything. Really everything. That's why I blame him for the pandy. Uh, <laughs> and it's okay. Our listeners will put up with your random musings on pre pandy episodes. We like it when people bring up old episodes. So continue to do it. Mm. And obviously you've listened for a long time because you mentioned all of them. I think that episode was just on the cusp of the pandy. Yes. Yes, it was. So Kimberly over on Patreon sent us a little comment. She says, I've started my October horror binge. Halloween ends. Again, what the fuck? <laughs> I feel like I was watching two different movies. A good marriage. I liked it. Good light fair. Another Stephen King short story. Trash fire. Cerebral. A little too long. Great, great twist at the end. Really liked it. Finola Flanagan, old woman from the others, was brilliant. Old lady masturbation. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Gross. Jacob's. Uh, well, don't watch Barbarian. <laughs> yeah, really. Jacob's Ladder, 1990, second viewing. Love, love, love it. Oh, I agree with Jacob's Ladder, Kimberly. I love I that movie. I still haven't seen it. I need to see it. So good. We need to add that to the docket at some it's point. Been. It's been. It's, it's been on our list since the beginning, I think. So out of those movies, I feel like we're probably going to talk about Halloween Ends a little bit. Spoiler alert, I haven't watched it yet as of the time of this recording, but I am going to watch it. Um, And A Good Marriage was a better short story than a movie. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any of these? No. Well, you've seen Halloween Ends. Yes, I have. You're saving us. I can speak to her what the fuck. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Kimberly and Chris, 
between her comments and what you're about to say, don't spoil the movie yet. I'm going to watch it this weekend. Okay. Okay. Els over on Instagram said, just wanted to say, I fucking love your podcast. I've said to so many people that they need to listen to as your mix of horror and lols are just everything. Thank you for doing what you do. And I'm so excited for the Treehouse of horror episode. I do, however, have one bone to pick with you. After listening to your episode on Suspiria, my brain cannot stop saying witch or as it's now morphed into bitch at the slightest inconvenience. Please, can you check out the 1977 Japanese film House, if you haven't already? One of us already has. The editing is insane, but there's a similar vibe to Goblin, in which the soundtrack shouts, House! <laughs> which I absolutely <laughs> need you guys to hear. Love to you both. You both put me in such a good mood. Sweet dreams. Oh, sweet dreams, Els. Thank you. Stay tuned for later on in this episode. We might be talking about House a little bit. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you enjoyed the Treehouse of Horror episode. Head back over to Instagram and leave us some comments about it. And we're going to read it. Yeah. Witch! (laughs) Bitch! (laughs) Uh, Sean Homerig on Twitter sent us a tweet and he said, Also, can you do a deep dive on Clue? Maybe for the Patreon folks? Not horror, I know, but no gay film podcaster can go on without dedicating a podcast to that film. I feel like we've talked about it a bunch, and it's been on some lists. Yeah, it's been on lists. We've talked about it, but we have not done a deep dive, and we will eventually. Oh, sure. Clue is one of my top five favorite movies of all time. I feel like we should do, like, uh, we're going to get around to, like, more horror comedy months every single year, right? We do that every April. Mm -hmm. And so Clue, Little Shop of Horrors, like, those are things that are going to be showing up. Yes, for sure. So stay tuned, Sean. And um, I don't know. Should it just be for Patreon people? I don't know. No, I think it's going to be a deep dive. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. At Itza Mario from Twitter said, I loved your Prometheus and Covenant episodes. I'm happy you felt a bit better about them after some time. Do you think you'll feel better about Halloween Kills after some time? I had such a good time with that film. Yeah. Um, kills? Maybe not. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. It's good to hear from you again, Itza Mario. It's been a while. Now that I know what it is, that it's basically just a long like music video of Michael Myers just killing people, going into it, I might have more fun. I mean, I'll watch it again, but I won't have high expectations to like it. And then maybe I'll love it. It kind of subverted reason. my expectations in a similar way, but not as much as this this last one did. Uh, I guess to answer your question, we don't know. <laughs> we would have to watch it again, and I don't know that that's going to happen for a while. So you're right. Maybe our our thoughts on it will soften just a little bit like they did for Prometheus and Covenant. But Prometheus and Covenant are really good movies. Okay. And I feel like we thought they were good movies at the time. They just weren't what we wanted. Yes. Well made, we'll yeah. say. We, yes. we thought they were well made. They were well made movies. But, you know, weren't fans. No. But, so, now, but now we are. Anything can happen. We got two voicemails from Kimberly. Play them. Hey, guys. It's Kimberly. Um, I'm sitting here on a Thursday evening, about halfway through Halloween ends, and all I have to say about it so far is, what the fuck? Talk to you later. And here's the second one. Hey, it's Kimberly again. Follow up. I just finished Halloween ends. The ending was pretty good. What the ever-loving fuck was everything leading up to it, though? I'm so confused. So it's either really really good and I'm too stupid to get it or it's a steaming pile of dog shit. Um, yeah, curious to hear what you think. Bye. We'll get into that in a little bit, but short answer is yes. <laughs> God, I'm so intrigued now. You know, honestly, yes, as in it's somewhere between what you said, not that you're an idiot. <laughs> I, if we were before we were recording we were talking about this and i was like i haven't watched it yet i haven't watched it yet and i was saying that i wasn't excited to watch it because i'm not you know but i i'm a completionist and i'm gonna do it but after hearing those two voicemails and your like comments on them i'm kind of excited about it now yeah i mean yeah we'll, we'll get into it in a second okay we have some new patrons we have a lot of new patrons we do it's like a record-breaking month wow so Ashley has joined the Patreon family at the Film Flamer tier. Brandon has also joined the Film Flamer tier. Senior Sombra. And Richard Pringle. I like that name. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, thank you guys for joining the Patreon family and checking out all of our bonus content, getting those episodes early. Um, if you want to become a patron, obviously head over to patreon.com slash the film flamers and join the family over there. Vote in those polls, make your voice heard, have all these comments. We get a lot of conversation going on over on Patreon, but as always, we need to shout out our patrons who are at the film flamer tier or higher. Ashley, Benjamin, Brandon, Kimberly, Lisa, Penelope, Wall Stretch, but especially Ashley. Ashley and Brandon. Yeah. And Brandon. That's right. Especially those two. Mm. This month. <laughs> I've got, got to qualify it. <laughs> we change it every month. I don't know. <laughs> we haven't said especially Lisa in a while. That's true. Horror News. Twisters, a sequel to the 1996 disaster thriller, report, is reportedly looking to bring back Helen Hunt. I did not know that they were making a sequel, and I also didn't know that Helen Hunt was still, you know, presentable. <laughs> I didn't know they were making a sequel either, and she's not. So I don't know why they would do that. I wish she would just let herself age gracefully. I agree. There's no need for all that. No. All that surgeries. But anyway, Twisters. I'm excited. Could be yeah. good. I mean, I really, really like Twister. I think that we are definitely talking about adding that to the docket sometime soon, right? I think mm-hmm. there's been some requests for it, and we're here for that. I can't wait till it misses this house and that house and comes after me. That's right. That's such an amazing, very dramatic monologue for Helen Hunt. Yes. Back in her heyday. Mm-hmm. Um, but fine. I mean, I'd watch the sequel. Definitely. Well, it's not going to be the same without Bill. Oh. Rip. Rip. Rip indeed. But yeah, there was a Tori Amos song on that soundtrack too. They should have a Tori Amos sound, song on the soundtrack for the sequel. Hmm. No one cares. Does anyone care about the sequel? Do y'all care about the sequel? It's a little late for a sequel. Yeah. You might as well just call it a remake. Yeah. Nah. Might as well invite Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> Yonda Bont. Yonda Bont will be rolling over his future grave when that sequel goes out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, moving on. Terrifier 2 is making moviegoers vomit and pass out. And we are not covering Terrifier, and we're not covering Terrifier 2. So, yeah. I can see how this is happening. So Terrifier 2 is having a moment right now, though. So it is making so much money based on what its budget is. The word of mouth. Yeah. And so it's expanding into all these theaters and things like that. And I just, I can't, I can't watch it because I didn't like the first one a lot. Yeah. And and anything that kind of like exemplifies the horror ghetto is not something that super interests us, I don't think, Uh, based on your description of the first one. Well, I found it to be very, very misogynistic, like also with no story virtually. Yeah. I mean, it's just there to shock you and to basically be horror ghetto and to like gross you out and things like that. And like, I don't have a problem with violence in movies. I really, really don't. But some of the violence toward women in the first terrifier was bad. It was mean spirited. And I was just like, I I couldn't, I just couldn't. And I'm not going to watch the sequel. So if moviegoers are vomiting and passing out, well then. And I'm sure a million other podcasts are covering, you know? So if you want to cheat on us, then go listen to another podcast that's covering terrifier. That's right. But don't. But say our name while you're listening. We will not be ignored. We will not be ignored, listeners. Cheating listeners. (laughs) If you comment on that other podcast, though, accidentally say the Film Flamers. That's what you have to do. If you listen to another podcast, horror podcast episode, just know that we're in a dark corner somewhere switching on and off a lamp. (laughs) We know what you're doing. (laughs) And if you have a pet bunny, (laughs) hide the pots. (laughs) And second thought, don't go listen to those other podcasts. Talk about Terrifier 2. Go back and listen to our episode on Fatal Attraction. (laughs) It's It's a much better use of your time <laughs> it's a better it's a much better use of misogyny <laughs> that's, that's right <laughs> oh, that was correct <laughs> konami announces christopher gans is returning to, re- to direct return to silent hill and he directed the first silent hill movie did he yes he did which i recently watched within the last like year and a half right yeah and i've always been a fan i always liked it it's not great you know but i liked the visual treat of it yeah and still to this day those costumes like seem like they're cg and they're not 
No, I really like the visuals of that movie too. Those nurses are amazing. Mm-hmm. And the hot daddy pyramid head guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm all about it. Wait, are they in this? Do you think they'll be in that? Probably. Then I'll go see it. I can't imagine why not. Why wouldn't you put them in there? I don't know. But is Sean Bean going to be in it? It's the only movie that he didn't die in. That's right. I was going to say, did he die in that movie? Is he allowed to come back for this? (laughs) Sure. Bring him back to you. Coming soon. So we got a good handful of trailers for you guys. And we're going to start with 1899, which is going to be a Netflix series that'll come out uh, middle of November. So this month. Right. And this is from the makers of Dark. If you if you enjoyed that German show Dark, then uh, this is might be up your alley. And this looks like it's a mixed language. So it's like mainly like English speaking, but also has some German and maybe some French. Some French in there. for sure. Right? It's like an international transport or something going on. 1899. And there's some timey wimey science fiction, fantasy, dark, horror stuff going on. Yeah. So check out this trailer. It's going to be in the show notes along with the links to all of the other trailers and news items. I know you're going to be shocked, shocked by this, but uh, I haven't seen Dark yet. It's all right. You know, I mean, other people have recommended it to me, too. I need to sit down and watch it. This looks weird. I actually so. never finished it. I watched the first two seasons and then I, I never watched the, the third. Oh, there's more than two seasons? There's three seasons. Oh, shit. What's next? Bones and All, which will be out in theaters in November. Oh, I'm very excited for this one. And this is by uh, Luca Guadagnino. Yeah. And uh, the same guy that did that movie you like. Mm -hmm. Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. Call that movie by its name. (laughs) (laughs) And this also has uh, the Chalamet. Yes, it has the Timothy in it. And um, Budget Zendaya. (laughs) (laughs) I I forgot her real name at this point. (laughs) Taylor something or other. Swift? No, no. (laughs) She's not Budget anything. Taylor Swift's amazing. Uh, But yeah, so... Luca Guadagnino did the Suspiria remake as well from a couple of years ago. So it seems like he is continuing with the horror creepiness in his next film. So, and I don't, it's about like cannibals kind of essentially. Yeah. Supernaturally like a, cannibals. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It looks like they could smell each other and things like that. So yeah, it's a supernatural horror, but it's also playing it very grounded. Yeah. In a way. And it just looks like it's about a bunch of white trash or hillbilly where like where cannibals <laughs> Wear cannibals and they eat, uh, they eat humans, <clears throat> bones and all. So, we talked about this movie when it was first announced on a shooting the flames in our news segment just because I like that director a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to watch this. I'll probably wait for it to come out on streaming. Well, I mean, I'm not gonna go to the theater and see it, no, but. I mean, I'll watch it at home. Yeah. Speaking oh. of watching at home, Violent Night <laughs> is coming to theaters in December. Yeah. Uh, I kind of want to see this one. It looks fun. And it's David Harbour, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not horror. It's just a straight up action. And it just looks really stupid. It's like almost like um, Evil Dead vibes, except it's not supernatural. Well, I mean, it's supernatural. The fact that it's Santa. Yeah. You know, and all that. And it's David Harbour. But it's just so hokey. Like oh, I Santa Claus coming to kick some ass. I don't know. Like they've really got to strike a really specific tone for this to work. And so I'll wait for the reviews, I think. I mean, I just like holiday centered genre film. It doesn't necessarily have to be horror genre. Mike, I like Die Hard. That's a movie that I watch around Christmas time. Sure. So, I mean. And this one looks extra holiday y. Yes, it does. I mean, it's Santa Claus for Santa Claus throwing grenades. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, next up is Megan or M3 Gun. M3 Gun. <laughs> and this is a trailer everyone has to watch. I'm sure by this point everyone has seen it because this has become a fucking TikTok phenomenon well finally someone's using like the uncanny valley to their you know ability ability yeah because the cg on this bitch's face looks horrible oh my god you know but it's kind of intentionally done i think to make it look not so human Mm -hmm. and there's an uncanny valley there but this is about a doll right so it's like chucky but you know my buddy my buddy my buddy and me yeah (laughs) Um, kid sister, <laughs> kid sister, <laughs> kid sister, and me. So, this is kid sister, a doll, full size doll, but mm-hmm. it's a robot because right. her mom's a scientist. It's AI, essentially, and, or right? her aunt, or something. Yeah, she's like her aunt. She's taking care of her niece after her parents have died, and she gets this, she creates this AI to be her friend or whatever. M3 Gun M3 Gun really starts to fucking go batshit. And is protecting this girl, getting this girl to kill people or killing things herself. However, 
I think we can all agree there's one part in this trailer that's just the best. The three in the title? No. When she's <laughs> dancing in that fucking hallway. Yeah. Or whatever. It looks great. Yeah, it, it looks like it's striking a tone, but we'll see because other parts of the trailer are like really like trying to be grounded or something. And I'm just like, mm, I'm not sure. You know, I have a theory. You know, anything with Cole in the movie after it or anything with a number in it <laughs> as far as like replacing a letter. Like seven? Yeah, maybe sometimes it's just the stupid marketing department. <laughs> I don't know. I will totally go see this movie. Um, it looks crazy. It looks like it's fun. It's probably not going to be very good, but I'll at least have a good time watching it. Plus, I like that actress, the one from Get Out. So Yeah, yeah, she's in it. Mm-hmm. She is certainly in it. <laughs> she is in it with that, that doll. Yeah, <laughs> She's in it to win it. <laughs> Next up, we've got the Mayfair Witches, which, of course, is part of the immortal universe that AMC Plus is trying to accomplish, which is going to be launching in January. And so this will be, I guess, right after Interview with the Vampire kind of ends up its run. Uh, You know, so they're going to have something from the immortal universe kind of back to back. So it's going to be interesting to see how successful Interview with the Vampire is after its run and how this one is and how it compares, how they compare to each other. I mean, the trailer looks okay. But they were both, I think, uh, this is the one. I think Interview of the Vampire was shooting before we were there yeah. for the Overlook Film Festival. But Mayfair was actually shooting while we were there. Maybe they'll be shooting the next season of Interview of the Vampire or Vampire Chronicles when we're in New Orleans next time. Maybe. Mayhaps. I don't know. <clears throat> You're the, the resident Anne Rice uh, expert. What did you think of this trailer? I don't know. I never read the Mayfair Witches books. Oh. I never read like Lasher, Taltos or any of those. Okay. I read the crossovers that were in the Vampire Chronicles, but it meant almost nothing to me. <laughs> uh, but the house in that trailer is the house that we saw on our tour, right? I don't know. It the seems pool like, looks similar. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it seems like a serviceable trailer. I don't know. I don't have any... I'm looking at this completely from the outside. Yeah, and same. So, like, obviously, I haven't read any of the Mayfair Witch, which is books either. Um, it almost it, seems kind of beige, honestly. It is. It's a little run in the mill. Isn't that what you said earlier about it? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that statement fully. Like, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look bad. I don't, I'll watch it, I guess. You know what I mean? But I, I have zero expectation for it. Yeah. I'll watch it, you know, because now I'm invested. But okay. So last up in the trailers is Wolfpack. And I think this is a sort of spinoff of the TV show Teen Wolf, uh, which was famous for having lots of really hot young actors in it. And I feel like this is something similar. But in addition to those hot young actors, we have Sarah Michelle Geller. That's right. A shining beacon amongst a sea of prepubescent White kids. White kids. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a Paramount Plus show coming out in January. Yeah. Did you ever watch Teen Wolf? No. I haven't either. I think I was too old when that came out. No, I graduated from Buffy and never looked back. I'm aware of it. And like some of the, the guys in that show were really hot. I also never watched The Vampire Diaries. I didn't watch that either. I feel like Teen Wolf had kind of a queer element or at least some of the actors have come out as queer in some way. I don't know. I'll watch this just for Sarah, Sarah Michelle Gellar. Yeah. She looks good in the, in the she trailer. Does. I mean, she looks great. And just maybe you want Buffy. Yeah. But we, we're not going to get any more Buffy ever. We, sh- we, sh- we should. We should, but we're not. Yeah. I was saying we should get Janice Benson and David Fury and get, you know, Joss Whedon to sign over the rights or pay him off or whatever. And we should just get a new Buffy like franchise. I wish. God damn it. With Sarah Michelle Gellar. Yeah. And Eliza Dushku needs something to do. That's Yeah, she definitely does. Yeah. What's she been doing lately? Nothing? Waiting for the Buffy reboot? Waiting for Guffman? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Made no sense. <laughs> I love that movie, though. <laughs> this is my wife, Bonnie. I buy most of her clothes. It's an out of context quote for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wife, Eliza. <laughs> I make most of her shows. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, all, like Chris said, all of these trailers and all of this horror news will be in the show notes. So go look at them, come back, tell us what you think of them, whether or not you're excited for these things, and tell us whether or not you think that Twister needs a sequel. So in lieu of a hot takes episode, we are uh, going to talk about some of our Flamers favorites that we've been watching. That's right. Some recent watches. Yeah. So I kind of want to talk about some of the adaptations that have come out this fall. 
There's been a lot. Yeah, late summer and early fall. So that includes all the ones that we've been talking about, which is The Midnight Club, which is, of course, based on the um, young adult book by Christopher Pike. Mm -hmm. And Rings of Power, Mm -hmm. which, of course, I'm a fan of. And we've covered the trailers we talked about a little bit, uh, which, of course, Amazon has been shoving down everyone's throats. That's right. And Interview with a Vampire. And of all these three, the one I was kind of least excited about once the trailers came out was Interview with a Vampire. The one I was most excited about was Rings of Power, and I was kind of like just I knew it was going to be good was Midnight Club. And boy, were all of those expectations just kind of wrong. Yeah. (laughs) And who knew the best adaptation of all of these so far? Because I'm only on episode five of Interview with a Vampire, and it's kind of turning a little bit, so we'll have to see. Is Interview with a fucking Vampire? Interview with a Vampire is the best fucking adaptation so far. The first two and really the first four episodes are some of the most excellent TV I've seen in years. And I was surprised whenever you had, you sent me a message and you're like, it's actually really, really good. Um, I had just gotten a, a text from my uncle who said, who said the same thing. He said it was very, very good, very, very gay and was really well made. And so, yeah. yeah. So I watched the first two episodes with Chris. He was nice enough to watch them again. And he is correct. It's a well-made, very good show so far. And they kind of earn their changes at least so far. Yeah. And they kind of hang lanterns on it and it's good writing. And that's all of the difference. And especially when I compare it to something like Rings of Power, which was given a huge budget. So it looks and sounds amazing. Bear McCreary Mm -hmm. has an amazing soundtrack. And of course, he did a bunch of things, including like Walking Dead intros and things like that. But he also did Battlestar Galactica famously. The, the new adaption, um, newer adaption, I would say. Mm-hmm. And anyway, his score is amazing for Rings of Power. And um, it looks and, and feels great. It's a great fantasy show. Uh, for a Tolkien purist, it kind of pisses me off and pissed me off by the end of it. Uh, I was fully on board for the first like three, four or five episodes or so. And then it just kind of went downhill for me. But I'd still recommend everyone see it because there's really nothing quite like it. I mean, it's the most expensive thing ever made. Uh, and it looks it, you know. Um, so I think I've seen like four episodes at this point. Three, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it looks really, really good. And I was into it. But again, I'm not. And for you, it might not go downhill at all. Well, because I'm not that kind of a purist. I've never read any of these. I've read The Hobbit. That's it. You know, like I really know nothing about this. I've pretty much forgotten everything that happened in Peter Jackson's movies. Like it will be like watching those fresh when I watch them again. For you, it will probably be fine. And that's what they're doing. They're really going for the casual viewer because they kind of have to with a billion dollar series. Yes. they Yeah. They had to make that money back in some way. So they have to kind of appeal to everyone. Which, you know, when you try and please everyone, you end up pleasing. I don't know. Nobody. So I don't know. And then Midnight Club was, to me, kind of a disappointment. Because, again, my purism. (laughs) uh, I love Mike Flanagan. I love the way he writes. I love the way he directs. But he only directed the first two episodes. And those were really the best. There's a couple in the middle that are very good by some of the directors. But by the end, it gets way too Mike Flanagan and not enough Christopher Pike. You know, and so it, it departs from the novel hugely, hugely. And in kind of a much more YA way than the book is. I don't think we can blame Flanagan for this, honestly, because he wrote it. I can blame him. (laughs) Well, they had other writers, too, though. I I feel like I was watching the credits and I think there were some episodes that he only served as like producer or creator. Like he didn't write all of it. For for some reason, I thought he had written all of it, but only directed the first two. Well, and it's co-written with... A, a writing partner That's as true. well. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, again, I had not read this book. I have only read one Christopher Pike novel and, um, <clears throat> I knew nothing really about it going into it except for what you had told me, but I kind of like mirror some of your sentiment, you know, like it, it does start to go very downhill toward the later episodes. Yeah. Like the last three are not fantastic. Yeah. No, and they really should have just ended the way the book ends and kept the horror to the stories that they're telling, you know, cause these are a bunch of dying kids that are telling stories every night at midnight, you know, but they tried to do this whole like culty weird thing in the, in the main story, which is not really, you know, emphasized or even at all. I don't remember if it's even mentioned. I think she's trying to figure something out in the, in the book, but it's, it, it kind of unravels pretty quickly that is in her head and just like dying wishes of something that could maybe heal her. But I think it really is, is mostly like her thinking she, the whole thing of someone going home, I think, happens in the book, you know, and her thinking it's her, 
thinking mm-hmm. that she might be, but she does, she's not. And everyone slowly just dies because that's what they're there to do is die naturally. But the, the stories that are in there and the anthology stories are great, you know, at least some of them, you know, and they, they tried to do some other stories that I would have loved to see made into full movies and done better, but they only, you know, and so it just ended up being beige to me, you know, and I, I would have, I, I'm kind of now paranoid about season of passage if Mike Flanagan is still doing that, because that's one of my favorite books of all time. And that's one of Christopher Pike's adult horror books. I feel like you would like that a lot better because it's going to be a film. Yeah. And if it's completely directed by him and he doesn't go too off kilter. Yeah. You know, it almost needs to be a series. Well, and I think that when he's doing House of Usher, I feel like he's doing all that as well. I think I've read that somewhere. Like we'll see. Writing and directing. Yeah. I still like Mike Flanagan. I do. Yeah. I even, I mean, I liked this show. I thought it was good. It's decent, you know, but like most series i tend to lose interest toward the end of things anyway right like it's it's hard for me to maintain a level of enthusiasm over 10 or 12 episodes i get really into things for like the first six or so and then i'm like oh okay like wrap it up wrap it up wrap it up if you're gonna adapt something though it's like when you get to be like a celebrity writer you know as mike flanagan is i feel like it might be easy to dip into the ambition or thinking that you might know better. Yeah. You know, and I just, I raise the power is a perfect example here. Like they spent all their money on the look and feel of it with the music and the visuals and the effects and the costumes and everything else. These writers have almost no credits. These directors have almost no credits. Uh, the showrunners have almost no credits, mm-hmm. you know? And so they didn't actually put money into the people that are doing it. And, and so there's some really weird, lazy writing and rings of power. It's uh, there might be like one really good writer and you, and you get some really like nuggets of gold and stuff in there. And then there's some people that are basically like, you took our jabs, you know, which is kind of disappointing. Well, and I also feel like with Mike Flanagan, he likes to work with the same actors over and over again, which I respect. Right. And so now that you've told me that that whole cult subplot is not part of the novel. Yeah. I'm like, he literally created something for an actress that he wanted to cast. Yeah. And I think there's danger in that, too. I think it's good to have people that you want to work with and people that you respect, right, for their craft or whatnot. But you cannot just I – mean, I guess you can. You can create roles for people. But What I would have liked to see is that this be a continual show, you know, with, with new people coming and going because they're dying. Mm-hmm. And, but, the midnight, uh, but, but the Midnight Club continuing and those stories they tell to be the focus. Right. And the stories being like almost full hour, you know, stories from Christopher Pike's other books. Well, unfortunately, if this does continue to be a show with more seasons, they're going to continue on with that cult thing. So, I mean, obviously, that's the cliffhanger, right? I hate it. Yeah. I hate that. Okay. I mean, I just. Such a waste. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. So, else, here's the time where we tell you that I watched House because, <laughs> yes. After I had read your comment, I was just like, you know what? I've been wanting to watch that movie for quite some time, like years. I've been wanting to watch House because people talk about it in horror circles and how weird it is and things like that. And it's on HBO Max. So I was like, sure, let's give it a shot. And uh, that movie's fucking bonkers. Yeah. Like in the best way, though. Like it's really fucking weird. It took me a while to sort of like understand what the hell was going on. Um but you're right. It was a bonkers score, too. And it's just, I don't know, it's a really, really fun, bizarre movie. And I have to recommend this to a lot of people. I gave this movie f- a four out of five stars. I really want to see it. It's on my watch list. Good. You do. I, I can't wait for you to watch it. Actually. And my literal watch list, because I actually have one. I have one, too. <laughs> <laughs> I have things on it. <laughs> I have two watch lists, Chris. One on Letterboxd and one in my head <laughs> and one in my heart. <laughs> and I never watch anything on any That's room. three. <laughs> I added the third one at the last minute. <laughs> well, I watched Halloween Ends. I'm sorry. Um, no, I mean, you know, it's better than Halloween Kills. Okay. I can good. say that, at least on first watch. Yes. I might, like I said earlier, we might enjoy Halloween Kills more now that we know what it is. Um, you know... What would you expect Halloween kills to be? Or sorry, Halloween ends to be? Um, Jamie Lee Curtis killing Michael Myers. Okay. As a whole or just something that happens? 
I would feel like the movie should be leading up to Jamie Lee Curtis killing Michael Myers. I feel like you're going to spoil this for me right now. Though, okay. So. so that's an interesting thing. So we're going to come back and listen to that when, after you've watched the movie. Okay. And see if it, you know, up to your expectations. I think you, of all people, might actually like it. Really? Okay. Judging your... I don't want to spoil anything, but I was going to say judging your reaction to Barbarian. All right. Okay. That's intriguing. So... Can you talk about the movie in basic terms without giving away the ending? Do what the fuck moments happen? No, no, it's, it's not like a weird movie. Okay. It's, it's like non diegetically weird. Like what the fuck are they thinking? This was their chance and they did this to be contrarians. Like just kind of like Halloween kills was, but in a weird way, like this is more contrarian, Okay. you know? And it's just like, it feels like, why is this the person that gets to remake Exorcist? <sighs> Forgot he's remaking Exorcist. Yeah. I think a teaser came out for that too. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. <clears throat> All right. Well, you know what? I'm going to watch the movie this weekend because at the time of this recording, we are in Halloween weekend and I have a whole list of shit that I want to get through. Um, and guys, as always, we are going to have our year end review episode and I'm sure that it will come up again or maybe next month in the next shooting the flames. Who Meanwhile, knows? I will read my letterboxd review. <laughs> <laughs> I gave Halloween ends a three and a half star. Oh my goodness. It's higher than I thought you were going to. Me too. Actually. I'm wondering why I gave it that extra half. Anyway, it says not the Halloween finale we wanted, but the Halloween finale we, ugh. Fuck it. It was actually okay this time around. And for fuck's sake, I'm glad it's over. (laughs) (laughs) And it is a funny review. I did laugh when I saw it on Letterboxd, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Wasn't the movie we wanted or needed. (laughs) But we got it anyway. It was okay. I mean, they had to wrap it up. So, I don't know. We'll, We'll talk about this, I'm sure, after I've seen the movie. But... It started out promisingly. I mean, I liked that. The first one is by far the best. Yeah, that retconned one, you know, and then Halloween Kills just really put a fucking bad taste in my mouth. Yeah. And and I I think we were very excited for Halloween Kills. We watched it the night it came out on Peacock. We sat there and watched it together. And then for Halloween Ends, like, we never even mentioned watching it together. The irony is real. You know, it's like he was like, you know, I don't want Halloween, this franchise, this amazing franchise, to, you know, have that fate of starting off with this amazing classic movie and then kind of just like collapsing like a flan in a cupboard, mm-hmm. you know? And so I'm going to make a new series that starts off really well and then collapses like a flan in a cupboard. <laughs> this is the kind of shit that Alanis Morissette writes songs about. <laughs> I mean, come on. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I really do think so. Okay. I'll report back. I'm watching it this weekend. I'm going to probably, I'll watch Halloween ends and then not even want to celebrate Halloween. I'd be like, fuck this entire holiday this year. Fuck it. This post pandy Halloween, whatever the fuck. (laughs) Uh, So I have been watching the 101 scariest movie moments over on shutter. This is a series, right? And they have been like promoting the fuck out of this show on social media. And it sucks. And it kind of does suck. So I've watched the first four episodes. So I'm getting down to the end of the countdown. Now I need to catch up. But the very first episode just pissed me off so much that it took me a couple weeks to pick it back up because I was just like, fuck this countdown. It's dumb. First of all, it's called the 101 scariest movie moments. And In these kinds of like clip shows like this, they're obviously going to talk about the movie as a whole. Some of the movies, they don't even mention a very specific moment. And so I'm like, well, they just say the movie. Yeah. They're like, well, this movie's scary and blah, blah, blah. No, I want scenes. Yes. I want like the scene from, you know, Exorcist 3, you know, or this Dolby shock. It could be from a horrible movie, but a really good jump scare. You know, or something like that. For a lot of the entries, they do. They they spend some time talking about that very specific moment. And I really like it when they do that. But that aside, I feel like they didn't follow the assignment. You know what I mean? You cannot have a random mention of a movie as a whole. And they're talking about all these different moments in that movie. Pick one. Mm-hmm. But what pissed me off the most is that they have got some literal scary things. Some very, very good scary moments and scary movies in like the worst placement in this. Number 101 was It Follows. And I was like, if It Follows is 101, like what the fuck is going to be happening in the rest of this countdown? So, and The Strangers in the 90s. 
I'm like, that is one of the scariest movies ever made, in my opinion. How can it be in the fucking 90s? That needs to be. Have they released the top 10 yet? Uh, that episode just came out this week. Oh, we might have to watch it tonight just so I can judge it with you. Just to see what. Well, I haven't. I still have to watch from like 20 on. Who cares? <laughs> well, I'm going to watch it anyway. I'll watch it. It's fine. Yes, yeah, so we may have to do that tonight just to see what the top 10 is because that's just one episode. So I don't know. We'll see. Shudder, though. I mean, like, I love your programming. I'm glad that y'all did something like this. This is from the same producer who did like Eli Roth's horror, like, docuseries, right? Kurt Sienga. And he's a big horror fanboy. And I was just expecting a little bit more. And I was expecting these things to be ranked a hell of a lot better than what they are. And when we try and watch it tonight, we'll see if uh, AMC Plus was lying about having all the Shutter content. Oh, that's right. I've also been watching uh, Queer for Fear on Shutter. Well, I've watched the first episode so far. It's a three episode docuseries about like queer influenced horror. Okay. Right. And. This is done by the guy who created Hannibal, the TV series, Brian Fuller, yeah. who is a gay man who loves horror. And the first episode is really, really good. They're talking about like how, how queer horror was like from the very beginning. This is all about like Mary Shelley and Bram Stoker. It's like a literary horror, right? And it was super fucking interesting. And I really, really enjoyed it. I cannot wait to watch the other two episodes. Um, this is really right up my alley. So if you're looking for a docu series or something to watch on Shutter, maybe skip the scariest movie moments and go straight in for the queer for fear. Awesome, because it has a lot of like like gay talking heads talking about horror, which is something I love. Cool. I love gay people and I love horror. Awesome, I'll definitely watch that. Don't be too enthusiastic about it though. No, because I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm just like I'm wondering. I'm wondering if like I don't want to like retread old ground. You know what I mean? Like I don't want to like an hour talking about like Freddy's Revenge. We oh, and it's not going to be like that. Yeah. Like they're like, they literally, I mean, cause if they were just talking about like horror in movies, you know what I mean? It would be a lot different. Like they literally are talking, it's a whole episode just about novels. That's amazing. Okay. I really do want to watch that. I'm going to add it to my watch list. Yeah. My real one. The real one. I don't think you can do it on letterbox. So you're going to have to keep it in your heart. Damn it. Yeah. See. So I watched with you, I believe Hellraiser. Yes. We watched it together. And it was certainly a movie. It was a movie. I was so looking forward to this, especially after seeing that amazing trailer. The trailer was great. Which takes out every good thing from it mm -hmm. and puts it into a trailer. Um. Yeah. Like the best thing about this were the Cenobites, really. The better, the, the best looking they've ever looked. Yes. And I loved Jamie Clayton. Yes. As Pinhead. I loved all of that. But we have this, this random story, you know, that's reminiscent of the Evil Dead remake, but like a cheaper version of it. You know, it's like a character study or a piece on this person that's a drug addict and a loser and continually makes bad decisions and ruins everyone else's lives around her, including her brother. And um, didn't really didn't really go for it. I would have much rather it, you know, been a retread of the original story or at least closer to what Clive Barker had originally intended, mm -hmm. even though he did direct the first movie. Um, you know, I would have loved to see it be a little bit more involved in the mythology rather than talking about it or showing it in pictures, you know, in books and stuff, you know, rather than just kind of like happening to them. It, it would seem very much like later Hellraiser franchise stuff where it's kind of just happening to them. And it's like the, their own horror movie that happens to have Pinhead and the Cenobites in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved some of the things they did with the <clears throat> architecture and like, I loved the, the hell coming from the back of the van while it was driving and stuff like that. Really cool concepts, but I still didn't love you know, the story that it happened in. Yeah. I mean, I have to agree with you. I mean, I didn't, I didn't find so much fault in the story itself. I just thought I wish the story was better, you know, but um, I mean, at the end of the day, when we're watching a movie like Hellraiser or any Hellraiser movie, we're there for the fucking monsters and stuff like that, you know? So I thought that was cool, but yeah, honestly, most of it was kind of ho-hum. When yeah. the Cenobites were not on the screen, I really didn't care. It was a return to form for the Cenobites, and especially Pinhead as being more of an arbiter mm -hmm. versus like some sort of like horror movie slasher, which right. it was turned into. Well, I never followed through with my promise to watch all the Hellraiser movies. So, yeah. But I mean, I can see how that happened throughout the course of that franchise. So still, this movie was better than Hellraiser Bloodline to me. Yeah. And probably well, i don't know if it's better than hellraiser 3 i, I, en I would better. enjoy watching bloodline better to me for yeah. me okay. it's not better made <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <clears throat> but 
but yeah, so that is available for y'all to go check out. We would like to know what y'all think about that movie. Uh, we always want to know what you guys think about the movies that we talk about, and these are no exceptions. So, and obviously, we take suggestions from you guys. We watched House. Chris is going to watch it soon, hopefully, and um, we will continue that conversation. Well, guys, I think that about wraps up this episode of Shooting the Flames for November 2022. That's right. And we need all your comments and questions and suggestions. You can do that on social media at the Film Flamers on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and now TikTok. You can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com or call our hotline at 972 666 I'll be your budget, Zendaya. Mmm. I'll be your Twister sequel. Mm. Could you Chalamet my peach? <laughs> Everyone loves a cummy peach, though. Yeah. <laughs> they should have called that sequel Titty Twisters. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we've already mentioned reviews on this podcast and where to leave them, but I think it bears repeating. Head over to Apple Podcasts and iTunes, leave us a five-star review while you like us, and we will read that on Shooting the Flame. Also, we had, as Chris said, a record-breaking month of new patrons, and we would like to continue that trend. Head over to patreon.com slash thefilmflamers, join the family, get all that bonus content. And get all of our episodes super early, especially this month. I think people are going to be getting episodes weeks early in some cases. That's right. Lots and lots of bonus content. <laughs> did you say? <laughs> what I think you just said? I did. It was on the tip of my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Only bit of goodie. That's right. Well, that makes me want to have some <laughs> sweet dreams. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck was that? I don't know. <laughs> Let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs>